The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, your word has already said so much to us. Let it settle in the recesses of our minds and our spirits and challenge us throughout this day and coming week. And now, Lord, as we focus on one of these readings, let your word just be like a laser going into the depths of our being, challenging us, encouraging us, bringing light and bringing healing in our spirits, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> we live in a world that sadly is bitterly divided. It seems to be becoming more divided every day. In too many cases, conservatives and liberals actually hate each other and demonize each other. Each screams their talking points at the other and there's no real dialogue. Very few people are really listening to the other person. Sometimes they pause before they get her up while they load their gun for the next shot that they're going to give, but there's very, very little real listening. There, there are exceptions, but they're few and far between. I believe the Bible shows us that sin is the great divider. We've been moving toward division since humanity sinned in the Garden of Eden. The deepest, the greatest, or most profound and consequential division of all is a profound breach between sinful humanity and holy God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, eternal death, eternal separation from the presence of a holy and infinitely loving God. Our reading of 2 Corinthians 5 addresses the answer to this frightening situation. Turn with me there to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verses 14 and 15, where the Apostle Paul wrote, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Now Paul will get around to powerfully teaching how the death of Christ reconciles us to God. He starts here by assuming it, in pointing us to the love of Christ behind the cross. The love that Christ has for us, combined with our love for him, constrains us, compels us, controls us. There's many translations because the Greek word behind it is a powerful word with a breath of a meaning. One scholar comments on this word, the Greek implies to compress forcibly the energies into one channel. Think of a massive vice being turned by giant arms, crushing in. That's what this word's talking about. Another scholar writes, the significance of this Greek verb is that Paul and all believers are completely dominated by the love of Christ so that they live for him. Another writes, to be driven along a course on which one cannot deviate. You cannot be touched by the love of Jesus Christ in the cross and continue to live in the same way that you're living before. It's impossible. Your actions may be the same for a while, but you're not comfortable with it all of a sudden. I re remember the point in my life where the Lord grabbed a hold of me and I began be, to be more serious with him. I, I had a period prior to that that, that I'd wandered in my freshman year in high school. I was headed in the, the wrong direction, and God grabbed a hold of my life. And for a while, my language sounded the same, and my actions looked the same. But instead of reveling in those things, I was horribly uncomfortable with them and wanting to change. And step by step, the grace of God worked those changes. And he, He's still working those changes. I'm far from a finished product. But we can't go on comfortably once we've really been confronted with the love of Christ. And we begin to see wonderful changes inside of ourselves. And those around us see it. The natural bent of humanity is selfishness. It shows itself in different ways and different people. But every single human being at the core is selfish. And some are selfish and trying not to be selfish. And think about that. The experience of the cross shifts this. It progressively transforms it. 
Since Christ died for us, Paul says that in a sense, those who believe in Christ are, are united with Christ, and therefore we die with him. And we are compelled to live in resurrection life for this lover who died for us and rose from the dead. The cross pushes us away from selfishness. It pushes us towards selflessness. Look at verse 15 once again there. It's powerful. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The cross draws us with an overwhelming force towards sacrificial living for Jesus Christ. Paul is essentially saying the love of Christ closes us in between two walls so we can only go one way, living for Christ, not for ourselves. Putting Christ ahead of self. Now again, that natural, selfish, old person is there inside all of us. And it pushes, and it screams, and it's not comfortable. But there's something else going on that we'll see in a few minutes. And the love of Christ is pushing us down these channels toward the way of the most blessed, happy, joyful life. But how is this possible? Since the sin of Adam and Eve, we want our own way. We want comfort. We want control. We want safety. We want to look good in the eyes of others. We want to feel good about ourselves. Conviction for sin is not comfortable. We don't feel good about ourselves when the Holy Spirit is convicting us. In the context of our broken sinfulness, how is it possible to do what the love of Christ is pushing us to do? The answer is in our text, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Through the cross and the working of the Holy Spirit, God breathes a new nature into the believing person. We were dead in our sin, and the Spirit of God, through faith in Christ, the faith that He initiates, recreates us as a new creature fit for the new world that will come when Christ comes again. The old is gone, and in the new is come. The more we receive that, the more we believe it, the more we see it flushing out in our lives. Now, part of the reality that's spoken in other parts, but not right here, is the old self, at times, is a very lively corpse. <laughs> like I said, it kicks, it screams. Mm -hmm. it, it's like the old story of the Indian elder who told a young Indian who was asking about dealing with his problems, trying to be a good person. He said that inside every one of us there are two wolves an evil one and, and a good one. But the one you feed the most is the one that will dominate. In the believer, the old nature is still there. But there's also the new creature. Which one is going to dominate? Which one do you feed the most? We feed our nature by what we take in. The music we listen to, the movies we watch, the books we read, the conversations we enter into. The one we feed is the one that will dominate. But the Spirit of God is pushing us toward feeding the new creature in Christ. When we're not doing that, and there's times in our lives when we fail to, again, there's that discomfort. For a short time, we might get caught up in going the wrong way. For a short time, it might be fun. But the fun stops when the Holy Spirit lovingly begins to put the thumb screws on us. Lovingly, because what's best for us is to allow him to make us more like Christ. That's where eternal joy is found. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, the first part of that verse says, all this is from God. The transformation, the change, even the desire to move in the right direction is from God. It's a miracle that is 100% from God. It's not a human work. It's not part God and part you. All this is from God. If it was dependent on me for a single second, I'd be in trouble. I can waffle all over the place. I can be indecisive. I can be decisive in the wrong direction. But the Spirit of God keeps drawing us back powerfully, constraining us. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. 
This greatest and most profound of all divisions is reconciled in Christ. The animosity that our sin created between us and God was ended for all believers at the cross. Once for all. Christ cried out as he died, it is finished. Our sin was paid for. The debt of our sin was paid in full. We are now not just friends of God, but children of God. Tenderly beloved children of Abba, Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Reading on in 2 Corinthians 5, 18. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. From the Garden of Eden on, there was this rift. And God heals that rift on the cross through the suffering and death of His Son, Jesus Christ. And He's given the job of carrying that message, not to angels, to us, to the church. To we who are reconciled, He has given the awesome responsibility of sharing with others the word that they too can be reconciled. Go ye into all the world and preach the good news to every creature. God's plan is that some of every nation, tribe, and peoples would come to saving faith in Christ as reconciled people are ambassadors of reconciliation for God to a lost world. That is why my heart breaks when I see Christians being part of the division in our world. May the Lord rebuke us. We are called to be ministers of reconciliation, not of division, of healing, not of wounding. God wants to make his appeal to lost people through you and me. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, was the cry of Paul's heart. Because we are so enriched by the love of Christ, we are compelled to live for Christ by showing him to others. How can you let God make your life a bridge for some lost people to find Christ? That's the question we need to be asking. It is so much more than passing out tracts or putting bumper stickers on, on your car or wearing clothes with scripture verses. All those things done wisely and in, in spirit can be good. But past that, deeper than that, how do we earn the right for our neighbors, our co-workers, our family to listen to us as we speak for Christ? In, in relationship, you better earn the right to be heard. And we do that by creatively showing the love of Christ in our lifestyle and our actions. We each will find different ways of doing that based on the unique personality and gifting that God has given you. Each one of us has unique parts of the image of God within us. There is no one size fits all. But among the common denominators is that it will stretch us. It will push us beyond our comfort zone. It will cost us. It will make us do things we're not comfortable doing. Because again, that old nature is there. And it wants to be in charge. I urge you to take the dangerous step of asking God, how you can become a bridge of reconciliation in the part of the world that, that is placed you in. You have contacts in your life that you can influence in ways that no one else can influence. Every one of us has some people who will listen to us that the rest of us don't have contact with. How can you let the love of Jesus Christ shine through your daily actions, words, and behavior? Pray for wisdom. Pray for grace. Pray for the Holy Spirit to lead you and give you power. Pray for Him to keep transforming you so that people see Jesus in you. That's the core of it all. Our words, our actions flow out of who we are, or actually who we are becoming. We're all works in progress. So praying for inner transformation is praying for mission. Because Effective mission flows out of a living contact with God through Jesus Christ.
in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul lays out the amazing reality underlying our reconciliation with God in verse 21. I have read this described as one of the most important verses of all scripture, and I agree with that. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake, out of love for us, God did something outrageous, unbelievable. Inconceivable. He took his holy, perfect son and began the whole thing by causing him to be incarnated in the womb of, of a virgin. And then he led him through a life of service and ministry that led to this, the cross. He made him who knew no sin perfect, holy, never sinned, never failed in any way, whatever. The only human being that can say that. But he knew, he took that one and did what? He made him sin. He made him sin. As Christ was hanging on the cross, all the guilt of all the sin of every man, woman, or child who would ever believe in Christ was poured on him on the cross. All of it. All the defilement. Every nasty thing you've ever thought, done, said, has been done to you. It all was poured on Christ on the cross. And he who knew no sin became sin. All that weight and vileness came upon him. Isaiah 53, 6 ties in with this saying, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God took all the sin and poured it on Christ on the cross. And he took the punishment, the wrath of God against our sin, and our debt was paid in full. If you believe in Christ, that he's the Son of God who died for your sins and has risen from the dead, you are reconciled with God. All your sin, all of it, the full weight, the full guilt is completely forgiven and gone forever. It is finished. It's paid in full. Christ is truly the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. And it gets even better. How can you top that? God does. Because of Christ's death, God declares us innocent. He acquits us. He drops all charges against us. It grants us the gift of righteousness, is how one commentator interprets what we're told here. But listen to the word of God. That we in him might become the righteousness of God. Not only are all charges dropped because they've been punished in Christ, but as God has taken your sin and poured it on Jesus, he's taken the perfect righteousness of God that dwelt in Jesus, and he puts it on your account. You're given credit for the sinless life that Jesus lived. You are counted as the righteousness of God. The early Anglican theologian Richard Hooker put it like this. Such are we in the sight of God the Father as is the very Son of God himself. God looks at you because of faith in Christ and he doesn't see you with all your warts and wrinkles. Oh, he knows it's there. But he's chosen not to see it. He sees Jesus being formed in you. Because that's going to happen. We shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. The Apostle John says in 1 John 3, 3, it's going to happen. He who begun a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. It's going to happen. Another writer says, the innocent was punished voluntarily as a guilty that the guilty might be gratuitously rewarded as of innocent. This is the wonderful word of reconciliation that God is calling you to share with others. This is the good news. And we need to be going out into the world saying we beg you on behalf of Christ be reconciled to God. In a world 
ripped apart by the divisiveness of sin. The church is called to be an agent of reconciliation. We cannot settle for any political agenda. It's far less than what we're called for. We must be about the agenda of the kingdom of God, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. That's what the church needs to be about. Show the love of Christ every way you possibly can. Seek to point people toward reconciliation with God and reconciliation with each other through Christ. Seek to be an agent of reconciliation in every sphere of influence that God gives you. Saturate your thinking, your emotions, your attitudes, your values with the amazing truth of 2 Corinthians 5.21. God loved you so much that he chose to punish your sin in his beloved son and he's chosen to do a work of transformation in you so that right now he's credited his own righteousness to you. Christ loved you so much that he took not only the whip and the nails, worse than that, he took the wrath of God against your sin to bring you forgiveness and eternal life. He did this to reconcile you to God. And now, he says, because I've reconciled you, go. Go and tell others. They can be reconciled. If they believe, it, if they repent and turn to the Son, they can be reconciled. They can know that freedom from guilt, that healing from brokenness. They can come and experience the love, the acceptance that the innermost part of their being is crying out for. Go. Be an ambassador of reconciliation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat>